think this morning about what Brother Charlie read for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As I began to look at verse 15, there is Paul writing to the church in Corinth says, And he died for all. We know that Christ came and he died so that all of mankind would be able to have a better life. But as I keep reading in that, where he gives us the admonition, where he says that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Out of those verses, I want us to look this morning as how you and I might have a blessed life. And I'm quite confident that all of us want to live a life that is full of blessings. We want to be blessed in many, many, many ways. But brethren, understand, our mindset says all of the blessings that we have, they come because of our own selfish desires. But I hope that as you read that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that you will see that truly all blessings are going to come by living for Christ. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to examine really five things. And I want us to look at these five areas of how that we might have that blessed life through living for Christ. Point number one this morning is that we must first of all look to Christ today. When I turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and I begin reading in verse 2, where it says there, the Hebrew writer says that we should look to Jesus, the author, the finisher, finishers, let me start over, that we need to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who is it that you look to today? I'm afraid that there are far too many who claim to be Christians, that claim to be members of the body of Christ, that they look to doctors or they look to lawyers. Yes, sadly, they even look to ministers or they look to their friends more than they look to Christ in order to find righteousness. Yep. When I go to someone and I ask a question, the question, if I'm asking something about Jesus, should not be based on your opinion or my opinion. When we look for Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith, we ought to look for a, thus saith the Scriptures. We should never listen to the words and to the opinions of man. What did Jesus have to say? There are many in our world today when you talk about controversial issues in our world. They will say to us, Jesus never spoke about that matter. Really. Jesus never spoke about a matter. When it comes to marriage, divorce, and remarriage, we have those, even within our own brotherhood, who will say that the words of Jesus don't belong in the New Testament, they belong in the Old Testament so that they might justify a position on divorce which is unscriptural. That's right. Jesus says it was never meant to be the way the people of Moses' day put forth. It was always God's plan in marriage for one man to be with one woman for life. Oh, but Jesus doesn't speak on homosexuality either, then, does he? Well, wait a minute. Where do we go for our answers? Jesus just said it ought to be the way God planned it from the beginning. One man, one woman. That does away with homosexuality in the words of Jesus. Yes. But too many look to the world instead of looking to Christ. And understand something. While the help from others can be beneficial to us, I'm appreciative of faithful brethren who have lived before me that have gone and studied in depth and taught me that I might be able to study in depth what the Scriptures say. We all ought to be thankful for those faithful men who brought us to Christ. We ought to be thankful for those who have taken time to share wisdom and knowledge, but understand they are not the final word. The final word comes 
from Jesus, as I go back into the Old Testament, I'm reminded of the words of Micah in Micah chapter 7 and in verse 7. Notice what he says. He says, Therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah, you're going to do what? Micah says, I'm going to look unto the Lord. You and I today need to look unto Christ. Point number two, if you and I want to have a blessed life, is that we must learn from Christ today. When I go to the book of Colossians and I read in chapter 3 and verse 16, where Paul gives the admonition to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. What does it mean for the word of Christ to dwell in us? It means we need to learn the things that he has spoken. You and I should learn from him today. However, there are some, and notice I put up there are some Christians who outright neglect or reject the word of God. The very words that Jesus has spoken, the very words that God has given, too many have rejected. And they have rejected those words because of personal pursuit. In other words, they're falling into the worldly mindset of humanism where all that matters is what I want. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. It's what I think and what I want to do. And so they say the Scriptures, although it gives a specific message, it does not apply equally to all mankind. Because my way of interpreting is different than your way of interpreting. But if we're going to be unified, we must all look to the Scriptures to find out what it says. And so as I think about these things, as I think about that, if you and I are to live for Christ, don't you think that we need to read and that we must meditate on the Word that He gives us? If I go back to Romans chapter 15 and I look in verse 4, this is a key for me. This should be a key for all of us. Where Paul, as he's writing to our brethren in Romans, says the things that were written aforetime were written for our... What does it say? Learning. Our learning. That's right. What does it mean the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning? I think we need to re-examine sometimes our thought on that passage. I understand that those things which were written in the Old Law and in the Old Testament were written so that I would learn how to be pleasing to God. But the more I've thought about that, the more I've studied, I've come to another conclusion that I can add to that. The things which were written aforetime are going to help me understand the things which were written in the New Testament. If you and I fail to have a proper understanding of the Old Testament, guess what? We're never going to be able to truly understand what the New Testament says. A case in point by what I'm trying to illustrate. The book of Revelation. I understand that the book of Revelation is a book that is written in, 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 in an apocryphetic apocrypha type of writing. I understand that it is referring to things and prophecy. However, we have so many today in the church who are saying, who say, oh no, we're not going to study that book. We don't want to study the book of Revelation because they say we can't understand that book. Brethren, go back to the book of Ezekiel and the book of Daniel. Study and learn them and you will properly be able to understand what the book of Revelation says. And you shouldn't be scared of it. Yes, I realize it deals with all kinds of signs and symbols and all that, but that's not the point today. The point is that you and I must learn from the old in order to make application of the new. And then I'm reminded of the words of Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, where he tells us that we need to be diligent, that we need to study. Why? So that we can grow. You see, you and I must learn from Christ. But thirdly, this morning, you and I need to learn to lean on Christ. And when I think about leaning on Christ, I go back and I look at Proverbs chapter 3, and I look at verse 5, where it says, Trust, trust, what does it mean to trust? Give all confidence in the Lord with all your heart. Why? Because you can't lean on your own understanding. 
If you and I were to lean on our own understanding and our own wisdom, we would still be as hopeless as the hopeless of all mankind. We would have no opportunity to look forward. You see, you and I as Christians, oftentimes people fail as Christians because they want to lean on their own power, their own position, or even their own possessions. Brethren, I, and as I said in the Bible class this morning, what did you come into the world with? What did you come into the world with? Nothing. What are you going to leave the world with? Nothing. It doesn't matter what possessions you have, you can't take them with you. Your possessions aren't going to get you from this earthly land to the heavenly land. You can't buy your way into heaven. Or we think about power. Or we think about our position in life. None of those things matter in the sight of God. What matters to God is, what have I done in order to serve Him? That's what the judgment is going to be based on. Therefore, I can't lean on myself. I need to lean on the Christ who taught me the way to get to heaven. You see, Jesus is the one who enables us to accomplish the tasks that have been laid out before us. He's the one that allows us to accomplish all of the responsibilities that we have. And to steal from my good brother Freeman, responsibility very simply translated means a response to ability. How do you respond to the ability you have? Christ wants us to use our abilities to serve Him. So when I go back to the book of Psalms, and I look in chapter 37, as I read in verse 40, it says, The Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them. Why? Because they trust in Him. When we lean on the Lord, He will deliver us. Because when we lean on Him, we're doing what He has asked us to do. Yep. But point number four this morning, as I think about living a blessed life, I also understand that I must lift with Christ. And someone says, what do you mean lift with Christ, Brother Ray? There in that passage when I talk about lifting, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says that we are workers or laborers together with Him. I want you to think about it in these terms. How many of you, by yourself, could lift a piano? All by yourself, you could lift a piano. And I'm not talking using pulleys and all those other things that, that are available to us. I'm talking about taking a piano and just lifting it up in your own two arms. Anybody here strong enough to do that? I don't see anybody. I may be wrong. If I am, you can prove me by coming over to my house and, and picking the piano up so we can clean underneath it. <laughs> I bet I don't get any volunteers. But if two of us were to go and we were to work together, could we lift that piano? Yeah. Yes. That's why when we lift with Christ and we let Him do His part as we do our part, we will accomplish so much more. And to live a blessed life, we must work with Him, not fight against Him. And so as I look at this, why is it that so many Christians fail to cooperate with the Lord or even cooperate with each other. Why does the church struggle? Is it because we don't cooperate one with another? Is it because we each think we have the best solution to all the problems? Well, when we put all of our collective thoughts together, we can move forward. You see, you and I are not alone. Christ is with us. He's beside us. He's within us. 
He's there to enable us to assist the less fortunate, to comfort the sick, to do all the work that he has asked us to do. The Apostle Paul sums it up best. And it's a passage we all know. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't do it by myself. But when I have Christ on my side, I can do anything. I can do anything and everything I put my mind to when I put Christ in His proper place and I lift with Him. But lastly this morning, and maybe, I don't know which one of these is harder. One of them may be harder for you than it is for someone else. But brethren, if we're going to have a blessed life, we need to love as Christ loved today. When I go to Ephesians chapter 5 and I look at verse 2, Paul there says, and walk in love as Christ hath also loved us and gave himself for us. How much did Christ love you? How much did Christ love you? Make this personal this morning. How much is it, how much did he love you? Brother, he loved you enough to give his life for you. But wait a minute, I think it even goes deeper than that. Christ loved us as He died on the cross while we were His enemies, Paul tells us. While we were not His friend, He gave His life for me. When I go to 1 John chapter 4, and I look there in verse 11, John, as he's writing there, says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. How much should I love my brethren? If crucifixion were still in existence today, how many of you would be willing to go to the cross and die the cruel death on the cross for one of your brethren? When I say God loves me and we ought to love as God loved us, we ought to be willing to go to the point of death for one of our brethren. I believe Jesus spoke of that when he says that there's no greater love that a man can have than to lay down his life. What? For a friend. How many of us love that much? How many of us love to love in a way that it is a self-sacrifice than when we serve others? You see, for you and I today, for us to live for Christ, we've got to look for Him. We've got to learn from Him. We've got to lean on Him. We've got to live with Him. And we've got to love as He loved. So the question for you this morning is, are you doing those things? Are you doing the things that you need to do in order to have a life that is a life of blessing? You see, you and I, as we know that we should, we should be following the footsteps of the greatest example we ever have, and that's Jesus Christ. I'm afraid too often today the reason that we don't have the blessed life that we desire is because we don't walk in those footsteps. We want to walk in our own, but we need to be reminded that we need to walk in His footsteps because He left them for us as an example. But in order really to truly walk, we first have to be committed to Him. This morning we may have one in our audience who's not a member of the body of Christ. And you need to come this morning with an obedient heart, with a mindset that you want to change the way you live life. Repent of the way that you are living. Changing the course of your life to live for Him with repentance, confession in your mouth. Confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Be immersed with Him in this watery grave of baptism so your sins can be taken away. As you rise out of that watery grave, you begin to walk in a newness of life and the blessings begin to flow. And as you continue to walk in that light, the blessing of life will continue to be there for you. But we may have one this morning whose life has not been what it should be. Perhaps you've turned back to the way of the world 
And you need to come home this morning repenting of sin that's in your life, confessing those sins before this assembly, before the God of heaven. Will you let your brethren pray with you and pray for you? We're here for you. We want to help you as you journey from the earthly land to the heavenly land. You need to come and make your need known right now while we stand and while we sing.